As folks adapt to this changing world, we are all going to be buying more stuff online. If you're an e-commerce seller, are you ready to meet the demands of our new delivery culture? Be ready with ShipStation. ShipStation is the fastest, easiest, and most affordable way to manage and ship your orders. Just a few clicks and you'll be managing your orders, printing out labels, and getting your product to happy customers. We've talked a bunch on here about the new merchandise. ShipStation will make it easy for me not only to receive your orders, but to get them out the door on time. Y'all not going to be calling me asking me, D, where's my order? Because it'll be in your mailbox. No matter where you're selling, Amazon, Etsy, your own website, ShipStation brings all of your orders into one simple interface. And it's really easy to manage from any device, even your cell phone. And right now, Ratchet and Respectable listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code RESPECT. Make sure your business is ready to meet the demands of delivery culture. Get started at ShipStation.com today. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in RESPECT. That's ShipStation.com. Then enter offer code RESPECT. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you're listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. I am finally back in LA after an overextended jaunt in Atlanta. No complaints though, I had an amazing trip. I connected with some really good friends while I was in town, missed some others. I expected to be working 12 or 16 hour days when I was there, so I didn't give a lot of people a heads up that I was coming in town. And then not even thinking about it, I posted from Atlanta. And so all of my Atlanta friends hit me up like, yo, what's good? And I was like, um, I leave tomorrow and I have to work most of the day. I made a few people a little unhappy. When I was hanging out in Atlanta, I went to my sister's house. I'm an only child. I call her my sister because that's the best way to describe her. But she also has a loft in Atlanta. Her loft is three times the size of mine for $900 less. Like my feelings were hurt. I went to another friend's house. She pays the same thing I do. And she has floor to ceiling windows overlooking a view of the park where she can see the sunset that's in her living room and dining room in her bedroom she also has floor-to-ceiling windows and they face the atlanta skyline her bathroom her toilet again floor-to-ceiling windows i'm like so you sit on the toilet with this view seriously had me rethinking my whole life i don't know why i do this to myself every single time i go to atlanta i think why am i not living here Like the place I just moved into, I've said it's my last rental. Right now, I could move to Atlanta and I could own like a dope townhouse for less than I'm paying in rent on a very nice loft in a very nice part of town in a doorman building with all of the amenities. But I could also own some shit. It it just, my feelings are hurt. I don't know why I do this to myself. I don't know why. But I finished my project in Atlanta. I'm really happy with how it's turning out. And I'm not saying what it is because I can't announce it. I can't scoop my quote and unquote employer at the moment. They would be really, really mad at me. So I'm just patiently waiting. But God, it's on the tip of my tongue. I can't wait to share with you what I've been working on. I'm super, super excited about it. We've had some birthdays this week. I'm recording on a Tuesday. It is Barack Obama's birthday. So happy birthday, Father Barack. People ask me sometimes, they were like, why do you refer to Barack and Michelle as mom and dad? I haven't done it in a while, but in my head, I still do. And I'm like, because the president is the father of the nation. And Michelle Obama used to refer to herself as the mom in chief. That's all. I don't mean to disparage them. I say it in the most loving way possible. If I'm going to pick another set of parents, I'm going for the gold. I'm going for the Obamas. Come on. It just makes sense. It's also the birthday of Meghan Markle. Technically a duchess, but I just like to call her a princess because it sounds wonderful. So happy birthday, Meghan Markle. And Lori Lightfoot, mayor of Chicago, who has been giving President Trump hell while also leading Chicago very efficiently during a global pandemic. So happy birthday to Lori Lightfoot. 
I really just love her. She gives absolutely zero dams, and I am here for it. Remember when she told the citizens of Chicago to get off the basketball court? Your jump shot ain't never going to be right. Stay home. Love her. There's a lot going on this week, and I don't quite know where to begin. So let's just begin at the beginning of my notes, at least. Tiffany Haddish is in a relationship with Common. She says that she is in love. Weren't they denying this relationship like a few months ago, even though they were like always together? Ain't that much boy bestieing in the whole wide world, but I get it. It's not really any of our business who any celebrity dates. And having a whole bunch of people in your business sucks. Could tell you that one from personal experience. So not telling us is beyond valid. I get that. But recently, during an appearance on Steve O's podcast, Wild Ride, Tiffany confirmed, quote, I am in a relationship. She added, this is hands down the best relationship I've ever been in. I feel more confident in me. I'm just way happier, and it's like knowing I got somebody that cares about me that really has my back, and I love it. I love him. Common and Tiff first met on the set of the 2019 film The Kitchen, where they played love interests. Tiffany says they started off as friends, and during quarantine, they were FaceTiming all the time, and now she says, quote, yeah, we've been fucking. Oh, Tiffany. (sighs) Her way with words is her way with words. Not that it's any of my business, but since she put it out there, I feel two ways about them together. I mean, part of me is thinking, you know, good for them. If you know me, know me, you know that I'm very much a hopeful romantic. I mean, there's a certain type of person that decides to edit romance novels for a living. That mushy, sappy, I believe in love part of me always will exist. Even if I don't wear that on the surface, it's in there. I love love. Love feels good. It feels amazing. It's contagious and it's wonderful. And if she's happy, then I am uber happy for her. Then there's the other part of me. I'm like, sis, you out here claiming community dick. Common is for the community. He is. He's been enveloped by damn near every notable thinking woman in the entertainment industry. He's like the super head of men. He's had the sex with everybody. See, this is when that double standard really rears its head. Because a woman with Common's body count would be called a whole loose hoe. But because he's a man with a history of being unwilling to commit at 40 and change, he's considered a catch. I guess. I mean, I have nothing against Common, just to be clear, right? I don't know the man. I've met him a couple times, usually with people he was dating. That's neither here nor there. And I do feel that folks can be reformed. They can change their ways. I'm just saying. I feel like he's the kind of man you don't claim, at least until there's a ring on it. So you don't be out here looking crazy six months from now with folks looking at you crazy for trying to make a hoe into a husband. I'm not saying the man's a hoe. I'm not going to call him out his name. I'm just saying if he was a woman, that's the name people would be applying to him. He would have a nickname like Superhead. That woman's whole name is Corinne Steffens. But nobody calls her that. They call her Superhead. Because of her talents in a particular area of sex. If you've never seen the video, it is worth watching. The woman is very talented. And I like Tiff. You know, Tiff is a little raw for me. I've been critical at times. There's been a lot. But the one thing that just took me over the edge was was her pulling up her gown to jump over a rope to say hi to Meryl Streep. And then Meryl Streep basically dismissed her. And I was like, ma'am, I could see if it was Oprah. But Meryl Streep, and she's a wonderful, amazing actress. Like, I get the allure. But I was like, just pulling up your gown and hopping over a rope like, ma'am, some decorum. And that sounds terrible because this is a podcast called Ratchet and Respectable. Like, I clearly believe in a little ratchet in life, but to a line, there's limits. Not at the Oscars, not in your good gown. And not for Meryl Streep. I guess she really likes Meryl Streep. But Tiffany Haddish seems like a very sweet lady. And she's a little raw, but I don't feel like she means any harm. And I don't want to see her hurt. So I hope things work out with him however she would like them to and whatever that looks like for her. Kamala Harris is also in the news. She's on the short list for consideration as Biden's VP. And there have been leaks from the Biden camp complaints that Kamala Harris is, quote, too ambitious, which I think is a horrible thing to level at a woman. There's a great quote from what is her name? The Nigerian author and feminist, Chiamanda Ngozi Ndiche. She has that wonderful quote. A lot of people know it from Beyonce's album. 
This is what she said, quote, we teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller. We say to girls, you can have ambition, but not too much. You should aim to be successful, but not too successful. Otherwise, you would threaten a man. I think that's exactly what we're seeing here with Kamala Harris being called too ambitious. She's not the first woman to have that term leveled at her in a bad way. When you talk about ambition in men, everyone supports it. Everyone thinks it's amazing. Everyone says, that's good. You should be ambitious. You should aim for the top. But just as Adiche says, we tell women, be ambitious, but not too ambitious. You should be happy with being a senator. You're only one of two black women who've been such. You should be happy with that. That should be enough. Trying to be VP? Who do you think you are? A while ago on the podcast, we talked about Stacey Abrams and how she was actively campaigning to be the vice president. And people said the same thing to her. Who do you think you are? Well, I think she thinks she's motherfucking Stacey Abrams. I think she thinks that she is qualified and I think that she's going after what she wants. And whether she gets it or not, I respect the hell out of her for going after what she wants. More women should in all aspects of their lives. Professional, obviously. Personally, obviously. But I mean, literally in every aspect, if you want something, your ass should get up and go get it. At least try. Don't be sidelined by people who want to put you in a box that they built for you that you were never meant to be in. I think every woman with any ambition, even the ones who are trying to play it small, when people see women going after something, even when it's a man or marriage or having children, which are things that we tell women that they're supposed to do, that that's their purpose in life. But when people see women going after those things, they say they're thirsty. They say they're desperate. They say they're doing too much. I'm like, well, how are you supposed to get it if you don't go after it? And it doesn't make any sense because it's not sensible. It's not logical. If a woman goes after too much and she tries to get her own, you call her too ambitious. And you say it with slander, not admiration, not with encouragement. If you feel like a woman isn't doing enough, you don't feel like she's maximizing her potential then that woman gets called lazy or a gold digger if we're talking about relationships. Women get put in this catch-22 where it feels like you cannot win, which is why I say go on and do what the fuck you want to do anyway. They're going to criticize it one way or another, so at least you should be happy. Ain't nobody else going to be it, so you should be it. Speaking of happy women, can we talk about how happy I was watching Black is King? Beyonce's latest visual album. Weird thing. I never listened to The Gift. It was part of the soundtrack for the live action version of The Lion King. That movie was disparaged by many. A lot of people were like, nobody asked for this before it came out. And then after it came out, they were like, yeah, no one asked for this. We were fine with the original Lion King. This did not need to be redone. But I just never listened to the album. So watching Black is King was very much like giving me new music and like these amazing visuals. I watched, The day it came out, I watched it at my sister's house in Atlanta in her gigantic loft that you could do cartwheels and backflips through. I feel a way about that loft and the price of it. I really in my feelings about it. She has this gigantic TV and these rugs in front of it. And I just sat right down on the rug like, like a child. And was just mesmerized. I guess I could do a critical analysis of it. But I said this on Instagram. I don't want to. I know that might sound weird. But sometimes I just want to enjoy things without thinking really deep about them. I've always been like a really critical thinker. Like I overthink everything. It's, it's a bad habit of being an English major. And also being a journalist. Like you're just trained to question everything and dig into everything. And I just, I just don't want to. It got really bad for me after I finished screenwriting school and I had to watch all these pilots and and analyze shows for like what works and what doesn't and the pacing and the character development and the introduction of characters and the dialogue and all of those things. And it makes enjoying things really, really difficult unless it's an excellent TV series or a film. Like I find myself picking it apart. So when something's really, really good, I can get lost in it and not think about it. But when something's just okay. I'm thinking about all the perceived flaws that I see. And that's really standard for screenwriters. I have a bunch of friends in LA who write for various shows. And they're like, oh no, that's not just you being hypercritical. That's like a a downside of the job. But watching Black is King, I'm sure if I wanted to dig into the nitty gritty of it, I could find things wrong with it. But honestly, I've watched it three times. 
I won't go as far as to call it flawless, but like, I loved it. I just like seeing black excellence. I like the white butlers. I heard white people were upset about that. And I was like, how you think black people felt all these years? Y'all got whole movies. And the only thing black people do is be the butler, the waiter, and the elevator attendant. How you think black people felt watching that ish? Like you sidelined us. Like we wasn't whole people. Like we were just created to serve you. Now you know how it feels. Stop doing that ish. So I like Black is King just to see black people dressed well, dancing beautifully, happy and joyous, just looking like money. The only thing, I said this on Instagram, the baby in the basket, I read that that was symbolic of Beyonce's miscarriage. So I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying, like, you know, the baby in the basket goes back to the story of Moses. Moses' mama put him in a basket, sends him down river for safety to escape the Pharaoh who's trying to kill the babies. As a biblical story, I always pictured the baby going in a basket and going down a gentle stream. What Beyonce showed was like a baby in like choppy waters. There's a waterfall, like the water's rushing over the basket. And I was like, that baby drowned. Like, I really have anxiety every time I watch that scene. I'm going to watch it a fourth time, but I'm going to look away from the baby in the basket. Like, it really bothers me. Sure, that was an artistic choice, but I was like, y'all couldn't find no calm water for the baby in the basket? Send the baby off to safety? That didn't look safe. But overall, like, I loved it. I loved the visuals. I loved the blackness. I loved the celebration of African culture. I loved the hair. I loved the makeup. I loved the wardrobe. I love Beyonce dancing with the basket on her head. I saw some people complaining about it looked like she was doing devil worship. If there's a couple scenes where Beyonce's wearing horns, which I was like, you know, just because it's not Christian doesn't mean it's devilish. And there are other meanings for horns beyond the devil. Like one of the scenes with it looks like a horn and there's like a moon either at the top or below. I don't have the picture in front of me. People were using that image to say like, oh, Beyonce's doing devil worship and this is the Illuminati. And I was like, you know, or maybe she's honoring an Egyptian goddess of fertility. Or maybe, I don't know, I was reading up about this, that cow horns are sacred in some traditions in South Africa. Seeing as how she did a whole film that draws on traditions from various countries and cultures in Africa, isn't it all possible that she was paying homage to cow horns? And not worshiping the devil. I also need to say this as a Christian, right? We got some rituals that seem a little devilish. People don't like when I say this, but it's the truth. That whole thing we got about like, you know, drinking wine or grape juice and calling it the blood of Jesus. That would be called devilish if Christians weren't doing it. If there was some other culture and they were drinking something, they were calling it, oh, this is the blood of Christ. Christians would be looking at them like, oh, devil worship. Sometimes you need to examine your own traditions and look at how they could be perceived as a little weird to people outside the culture. I'm sure there are some Muslims and some Buddhists somewhere. They looking at that blood of Christ thing and they looking at Christians like, what what y'all doing over there? We're going to eat a cracker and call it the body of Christ. We're going to pretend we eating somebody's body like that's. That's a little out there, y'all. I mean, we do it out of tradition. We do it out of ritual. But that's a little out there when you take it out of context. But you'd be like, no, no, that's Christianity. That's a sacred part of what we do. It is. And it's not devilish. But I say that so that you can apply that logic to some of the things that other people do that might not be familiar to you. Maybe take an examination of what that is before you start criticizing it and calling it devilish just because it's unfamiliar. Everything unfamiliar Ain't the devil. Sometimes it's just unfamiliar and it's something that you need to learn about before you start criticizing. This is all I'm saying. As folks adapt to this changing world, we are all going to be buying more stuff online. If you're an e-commerce seller, are you ready to meet the demands of our new delivery culture? Be ready with ShipStation. ShipStation is the fastest, easiest, and most affordable way to manage and ship your orders. Just a few clicks and you'll be managing your orders, printing out labels, and getting your product to happy customers. ShipStation makes it easy. We've talked a bunch on here about the new merchandise. ShipStation will make it easy for me not only to receive your orders, but to get them out the door on time. Y'all not going to be calling me asking me, D, where's my order? 
because it'll be in your mailbox. No matter where you're selling, Amazon, Etsy, your own website, ShipStation brings all of your orders into one simple interface. And it's really easy to manage from any device, even your cell phone. ShipStation works with all major carriers, including USPS, FedEx, UPS, even Amazon Fulfillment. So you can compare and choose the best shipping solution for you and your customer. And right now, Ratchet and Respectable listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code RESPECT. Make sure your business is ready to meet the demands of delivery culture. Get started at ShipStation.com today. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in RESPECT. That's ShipStation.com. Then enter offer code RESPECT. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen. I want to talk about an essay that came out today by Josen Cummings. Confession of an internet famous cheater. When I betrayed my fiance, I destroyed my relationship, but the shadow stretches over the rest of my life as well. We talked about this story when it first came out. In full disclosure, Josen is a friend of mine. He did a very terrible thing, but I still consider him a friend. Like me, my friends are not perfect. Many of them have done fucked up things, as have I. I just want to put that out there, not to absolve anyone, but just to be honest. The backstory to this essay is Josen Cummings was a very popular relationship blogger. At the same time I had my blog, A Bell in Brooklyn, he also had a blog called Until I Get Married. But the common thread of our blogs was two people in their late 20s and early 30s at the time trying to figure out relationships. Sometimes we gave advice. Most of the time we talked about our own dating and relationship experiences and how we process developing theories about relationships and what works and what doesn't. 2010 Weblog Awards, Josen and I tied for best blog. Josen mostly wrote about bachelorhood. He eventually met a very nice woman. I knew his fiance. I didn't know her well. I only met her with Josen. But by all accounts, like lovely woman, They seemed super happy together. Josen posted a lot of pictures. He talked about her a lot. They got engaged. Their engagement video ended up on Good Morning America, and they went on to talk about their relationship and their love and and all of those things. They were supposed to get married, and on the day that their wedding was supposed to occur, his fiance wrote a blog and posted it on their engagement site saying that their relationship had ended because Josen had cheated on her. And she posted screenshots that backed up what she said. Josen had had sex with another woman, sans condom. And when his fiance found the text messages, the engagement was called off and the relationship ended. That story trended on social media. Josen was and rightfully so, dragged to the depths of his soul. I reached out to him on the day it happened because he's a friend and he did a horrible, terrible thing. But if you've never been dragged on the internet, it's a really horrible experience. And for everyone I know that it's happened to, it fucks you up. And I just wanted to make sure he was okay. Like, yeah, you did this horrible thing. I, no buts, no ands, no conditions for that. You did a horrible thing. I didn't want him out on a ledge on the brink because that type of dragging, reaction, public shaming can really put you in a really bad place. That happened, I want to say last June. Publicly, Josen had not been heard from until today. He wrote a piece on Level, which is kind of like a GQ for black men. He explained what his life has been like since he said dragging. And someone pointed out, was it a dragging or were you held accountable for your shitty actions? I think held accountable might be a more accurate term. But he wrote this blog today and basically he said he's, you know, he's gone to, he'd been in therapy and he's gone to church. He was laid off from his job shortly after the blogging incident happened. He said other people were laid off too, but he does think that maybe his internet infamy has something to do with him being laid off. He says since that time, he's had a really hard time finding a job because 
you know, you want to hire somebody, you look at their resume, you say, okay, and what does everyone do? They go do a Google search. Well, the first thing that comes up is a bunch of stories, essentially calling him a trash ass human. So he said that he would do an interview. And as soon as people found out the backstory, they were like, you know, you're talented and you're qualified, but we can't hire you, which that's, that's a lot. Um, you pay a price in one form or another when you commit great transgressions against others in your life. And you never know how that will play out. Karma is a bitch. I read the essay. And again, I know Josen, so I'm a bit biased here. One thing that I, I try to be mindful of is not to use my platform to absolve men who have behaved badly. I've been critical of other women who have done so, particularly Jada Pinkett Smith in the Red Table Talk. I'm like, you've got this amazing platform and you've you've got this viewership of millions, mostly women, who are interested in what you have to say, who are interested in your opinions. And if you bring a man on the show, as she did with T.I., after he, you know, talked about checking his daughter's virginity, Jada forgave him and it kind of took the edge off the criticism And the same thing happened with Snoop when he said those horrible things about Gail. But Snoop made this video and he called Gail out her name in such a disrespectful way. Jada had him on the show and she greeted him warmly and with open arms. And and she let Snoop ramble and say a whole bunch of nonsensical things that she didn't call him on. She didn't hold him accountable. And I was like, yo, like you've got this amazing platform and you're using it in ways that soften the blow. For men who don't deserve the blow to be softened, I don't want to do that. I texted with Josen earlier today and in a knee jerk because we're friends and this is a viral story. I thought about inviting him to come on the show and I didn't. One, because don't want to use my platform to absolve men. He's a grown man and he's capable of finding his own absolution. But also because I didn't think he was ready to speak. I read the essay and I'm not going to analyze it. Only because I'm not going to be me about it, because we are friends. If we were not, I would probably be a lot harder on him and what he wrote. I've been very hard on guys that have said dumb shit on the internet a million times. Tyrese, Terry Crews, the dude who got his JD and was like, he's the catch now. And I just, I can't muster it up to do it for Joe's and I'm not going to be impartial. He's also, I didn't think, in a place to discuss it publicly. I'm glad he wrote an essay. He felt that he had something to share and a bunch of people have read it. So I guess it was something people wanted to read, even if a lot of people read it and was like, he could have kept that. But because I've been through a similar reckoning, I guess, for different reasons, but a public reckoning nonetheless, I kind of have a good gauge on when people are ready to speak and when they're not. I kind of wish he'd kept it just a little bit longer. I wrote about it on Instagram and one of the women in my comments said that it sounds like what happened to him was a tsunami and it got downgraded to a hurricane. And I was like, yep, that's kind of what it's like. It's also only been a year. And when you hit rock bottom in your life, we talked about this either last week or the week before with Andrew Gillum. And I was saying like, it's been four months, like, bruh, go sit down somewhere. Whatever series of turns in your life that took you to the point where you hit rock bottom, you don't unravel all that stuff in four months, nor do you unravel it in a year. It takes time. I tried to just keep pushing for a minute. I'm like, okay, like, I'm just going to keep going. I'm pretend everything's normal. I'm going to keep giving advice and I'm going to keep life coaching and I'm just going to be honest and I'm going to keep just being me. And a really good friend was like, sis, sit your ass down. If you're doing interviews and you getting in your car and crying after, you're not okay. What I don't want for you is having some meltdown on air that's going to play in perpetuity because you tried to do too much instead of sitting with your feelings. Like, go sit down. She told me that in December. Somewhere in the middle of January, I got a one-way ticket to Mexico and told my parents, I'll be back. And they were like, will you? But I went to Mexico and I wandered around and looked at doors. I refer to 2018 as my adult leap year. I was living at home. I didn't have any bills. My checks were still coming in and I didn't leave New York broke. So I was good in that sense. But I just took a leap year off life. And I'm just like, I'm going to fix myself. 
as, as opposed to like trying to just like push full speed ahead and just hitting unnecessary bumps along the way, I'm going to just get myself together so that whenever I figure out what I want to do next, it's going to be the right thing as opposed to just a thing. Give myself time to grieve my marriage. It feels like a death. The death of my dreams, of the life that I'd planned for myself. You know, because you go out as a single person and you think, okay, I'm going to do this. And then you meet this person and you're like, okay, like I love you and you love me and we're going to build this life together. And then there's a us life. When a marriage ends, it's kind of like, well, what the fuck do I do now? Fixing yourself when you fall on your face for whatever reason, whether it's circumstance or just some dumb shit you went and did that you ain't have no business doing. It takes time to get yourself back together. My best advice, if I can give to people, if you're going through some shit, sit down. It's the hardest thing in the world to do because you want to be active. You want to be mixy. You want to do stuff to take your mind off whatever it is that's bothering you. You need to sit down and sit with that shit. When I was in Atlanta, the old friend that I mentioned last episode, he reminded me the last time he'd seen me was when I was in town doing a cover story for Essence on Vanessa Williams. Vanessa Williams has been through some shit. She started out in some shit. Like she wins Miss America and then these nude photos come out. Other people would be completely derailed by that. She told me that her father said to her and he was like, look, you messed up. What you gonna do to fix it? Like this happened. You can't undo it. But like, what's next? So she got herself up and she figured it out and she becomes, you know, this amazing actress and this Grammy award winning singer. And she's had a full steady working career over the last four decades. She's also been married a couple times, divorced a couple times. So I did this interview with Vanessa Williams and we talked a lot about resilience and she said something and I just sort of teared up. And so we finished the interview and I said, can I just ask you just woman to woman, like, you know, you're sharing this story and I, I look at you and I know your history and what you've been through. Here you are still standing. And I feel like my whole world is falling apart. And this is before I left New York. I was still back and forth between New York and Maryland trying to figure out what I wanted to do. She was like, the only way you get better is to go through the fire. She was like, that saying baptized by fire is the honest to God truth. She was like, you can't go over it. You can't go around it. You can't go under it. And she was like, the only way is just to like, just look it head on and just walk into it. Walk into it until you get to the other side. Essentially walk through hell until you get to the other side. That's the only way. It's a painful way. The shit I went through, I wouldn't wish on anyone. Not even the folks who dragged me on the internet today because they like, oh, well, these two relationship bloggers, like, Josen fucked up his engagement. Demetria fucked up a marriage. Like, you know. And this is how I know that I'm, like, in a much better place. Because, one, I'm just like, well, fuck them. You know, you think I blew up my marriage and it's all my fault? Well, that's your opinion. There's absolutely nothing I can do about that. So, And then, two, I'm also like... I was in such a bad place at one point in my life that like, I'm kind of just happy I'm still here where I can actually hear you tell me I'm not shit. Because there was a time when I didn't think I'd make it. So here I am still standing. And that's all you can really ask for in life sometimes. A lot of people read Joseph's essay. They thought he was full of shit. Some people read it and were like, well, you know, at least he's on the road to redemption. I'm biased again because I know him. I think he's on the road to redemption. I think he did a very, very fucked up thing. Gina was a sweet woman and she loved herself some Josen. She did not deserve what he did to her. And not but and because I want the statement that was a really fucked up thing to do to a woman to stand. I don't want to negate it in any way. So and I think that he recognizes the horrible thing that he did. And maybe it's because it was found out and maybe because he was shamed publicly But I don't think he deserves to lose his entire career or livelihood over it. And I do hope for him, as I do for everyone who's been through some shit. I often like to say, and again, folks get mad when I say it, but I would be a complete hypocrite if I took another stance. There is grace for those that seek it. I see him trying to seek it. I hope in time he finds it. From the time that I did that reality show and like half the population thought I was like the greatest thing since sliced bread and the other half of the population thought I was like the purest bitch ever to be on TV. It took me five years to be quote and unquote redeemed in the public eye. It takes a while. 
So I wish him and everybody else that has fucked up and is on their journey of trying to improve themselves, I wish them well on that journey. There is grace for those that seek it. In Joseph's essay, he talked about how well-meaning people reached out to him and they said, you know, this too shall pass. And he made reference to Hillary Clinton's emails. And he was like, you know, you see how that worked out. And I was like, you're not looking at the whole story, bruh, because Hillary's emails were a big deal. And Hillary's emails might have cost her the election. But time has been kind to her. Like many a person has been like, well, shit, we probably should have voted for Hillary. We might not have liked her ass. But we also wouldn't have 160,000 people dead due to a global pandemic with no end in sight. Last but certainly not least, I want to talk about Jaguar Wright. Jaguar Wright was a popular neo-soul singer circa the early 2000s. She had an amazing first album. She sang the hook on Song Cry on Jay-Z's Unplugged. Her voice is amazing. I was a huge Jaguar Wright fan. I used to listen to that album over and over and over on a treadmill, sitting on the back porch of my parents' house. When I was 22, I'd gone to grad school at NYU, and my third semester was 9-11, and the budgets across the board just got slashed. I couldn't find a job for anything when graduation was coming up, and I ended up moving back home with my parents for seven months. I was just miserable. I'd gotten that taste of New York, and I wanted to be there so bad. And it killed me not to be there. And I used to sit on the back steps of my parents' house with my headphones on, and I would listen to Jaguar Wright's self-love. I would listen to it over and over and over, almost like brainwashing myself to figure out a way to get back to New York. There's a line in the song that goes, If you don't like your job, maybe you should quit. Stop being a bitch and love yourself. And she does this ad lib where she says something like, if you don't actively do something to change your circumstance, you will wake up at 40 years old regretting your life. And that was like my motivation to like keep pushing, even when I was sad, even when I was depressed. But I listened to that song over and over and During one of my reflective periods, I wrote about it on Instagram and I was like, look, like when you're in the depths of your shit, it's really hard to be motivated. Like you don't feel like doing it, but you do it anyway. That's the same thing folks tell you when you're trying to lose weight. You don't feel like working out, work out anyway. The consistency is what moves the scale. The consistency is what moves you in the direction that you want to go. So I wrote this and I tagged Jaguar right in it and she DM'd me a couple days later. I don't remember the contents of the DM. I wouldn't read it to you directly just because it was a private message. But basically she said that she had some experience being in some shit. I had no idea the extent of it until recently, which is what we're about to talk about. And she appreciated me appreciating her. And I think she also sent me a happy birthday message. Normal person, real chick, amazing talent, who I always wondered what happened to her. I'm like, you get a feature on Jay-Z's Unplugged and then where did you go, sis? Sis uploaded a series of IG lives that just, woo, she said a lot. She talked about being on the tour bus as a young artist. And she was like, I was 19 years old. I started dating this guy in his 40s just because if I wasn't someone's girl, then the guys were going to constantly try me. And so that was her way of protection. She talked about waking up one morning with Common trying to shove his penis in her mouth. I'm going to read you what she said. Next thing I know, we go to bed. I think she's talking about being on the tour bus here. And he's like, come on, Jag. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm tired, nigga. I was on the stage all night. I want to lay down. The next thing I know, I wake up. It's morning. I feel something poking me in my face and shit. Then I open my mouth. This nigga try to stick his dick in my mouth while I'm asleep. Lonnie fucking Lynn, Rashid, Common, whatever the fuck you want to call yourself. She talked about Talib Kweli being a pervert. She said Talib Kweli used to come to Black Lily in New York and hide out in the green room. We were getting changed, especially me, to watch me get dressed and undressed before I got on stage and then wait for nobody to be looking to sneak out. I've been holding all this in to make all you crazy backpack niggas look good. A lot of people said Jaguar Wright was bitter. And I was like, Okay, that doesn't negate what she said. And if you listen to what she said, she has every right to be bitter. That's some crazy shit. 
Is it true? I wouldn't doubt it because I don't really put a lot past men. And that's not on some like, oh, she's bitter about her divorce. No, it's just because I've been a woman a really long time and I've seen, heard, and been the recipient of some wild shit. Some folks were like, well, what does she have to promote? And this is where I have to eat my words about what I said about August Alcina. I was like, well, I don't know. He talking about Jada and they have a relationship and I just can't see her with this young boy. In fairness, the young man did have an album coming out. He used the truth to promote that album. Now, I don't know what's going on with Jaguar Wright. I don't know if she has something on the horizon. But sis, sis in her details, it just don't make no sense to sit around for 20 years and just all of a sudden just start lying. So I have read a couple articles about what Jaguar Wright had to say in her IG lives about all of this Neo Soul tea, but I'm not fully caught up. And I may not be fully caught up on some other things too, because again, I've been on the road. So I asked my friend L. Michael Gibson. He is a cultural critic and a community advocate. And I started following him on Facebook a couple months ago. And I was like, where have you been all my life? He's like me, but in male form. And he has watched all the Jaguar Wright videos. So he's much better versed on this than I am. So we're going to talk to him. Hold on real quick. Let's call. Mike Gibson. Hey, it's Demetria. How are you? Hey, Demetria. I'm good. I'm good. Glad to be here and talk with you. I have not watched the Jaguar Wright videos. I tried. I I can't invest two and a half hours into... (laughs) But I saw that you did. You were like, I watched it and it's, you know, riveting. So I'm relying yeah. on you to, to fill me in on what I missed. Like, I know the highlights. I know the accusations about Common. I know about Talib Kweli, who just got banned from Twitter for harassing a woman. I'm like, bro, you're having a bad week. Yeah, but apparently he just carried it over to IG. Apparently not learning any lessons. What? He's still harassing that lady? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god yeah sir needs a, she needs to file a restraining order he's not well that's crazy yeah. and apparently they hear her tell it even if it's when it's not him he's like sending other over folks it's, it's disgusting i mean this is not a good week for the conscious folks right <laughs> not at all for, for our conscious phase from the 90s and early 2000s exactly like not a good week yet. jaguar just like ripped the band-aid off everything like sis was like let me give you this this vintage criminal tea like common i was like what he did what you know, I don't know that people have the PR folks because the thing that we saw is that right after she said it, Common and um, Tiffany. Tiffany Haddish announced that they were a couple. And it's like, that's not good timing. That timing is so evidently about distracting. Look over here, not over there. And you know, you would have thought at this point by now as a culture, because of Cosby because of R. Kelly, we would be past this idea that people can't be more than one thing. But unfortunately, we're still under the misnomer that if you do really well or you're really talented or you have good politics in one area, that that means that you're good in another. And time and time again, we keep finding out folks are not. So, you know, um, you know I don't know that that means that people need to be canceled or if that just means we need to have more realistic expectations about who our, um, who our artists are, you know, as human beings. I've been a Common fan for years. Like, I love Backpacker Common. I love Come Close Common. I even love Electric Circus Common. I, lo- I loved Electric Circus. Like, <laughs> Knit Pants Common was, was good music. I loved it when he got with Kanye and they did that album together. Like, those beats were crazy. I'm a common fan. And I, I guess like I gave into exactly what you said. Like, I'm like, oh, because you're a dope artist and you make quote and unquote conscious music and you don't call women bitches that you must be a good guy. But good guys don't try to like, you know, shove their penises in the women's mouth while they're sleeping. No, they don't. I think that one of the things was like listening to Jack Wright. So she made allegations about, you know, shenanigans happening on the tour bus. I mean... I don't know that that's a stretch to believe that the Roots, as a band with groupies, would engage in some misbehavior um, while on a tour bus. Whether or not that rolls to the status of SVU every night, which was one of her quotes. I mean, one of the things that I 
have you know kind of come to terms with since watching Aisha Shaida Simmons. For those who may not be familiar with that documentary, know the rape documentary is that really prominent black men who are famous and do good in the community in other ways can be predators, can be sexual assault perpetrators, um, particularly when given a certain amount of power and a certain amount of plausible deniability. I thought about the same thing watching that um, the Russell Simmons documentary on the record. When it comes to powerful men, I believe the women more often than not because power corrupts. What we see it over and over and over again is it's almost cliche. I mean, and, and then when you know women speak out on their own behalf, you know they get labeled crazy. They get labeled as delusional or trying to get something. You know, Jaguar Wright owns her own mental health issues. She owns that she had a nervous breakdown. She owns that she has to do CBD to self-manage her depression. And she's had enough trauma in her life to justify and excuse it. I mean, in the video, we learned that her husband tried to kill her. You know, her now ex-husband lied on her and had her arrested. And she was in jail over the idea that she had kidnapped her own son and then was exonerated, you know, and found that all of those were lies. Um, then her son was murdered, and the people that she thought were her friends couldn't be bothered to send a flower or a condolence. Any one of those things would have broken a lesser person, or, you know, at the very least, it justifies her anger. One of the things that I loved about your Facebook post is you pointed out you can be angry and you can be bitter and you can be you can have mental illness, but you can also be telling the truth. These are not all separate things. No, I mean, and I think that it's easy and reductive to say because somebody's angry or because or even because they, you know, she has some music that's coming out and like. The time was around Malik B. Like, her anger is about the fact that her friend, who was chemically dependent and struggling with addiction, was dismissed and kicked to the curb by his so-called friends. And that those same friends came after his death to talk about how amazing he was and what a good brother he was, but wasn't present for him in his addiction, wasn't present for him in his struggle. I think so far we already know there's at least two lawsuits that have been filed against the Roots, one by um, Hub, which is one of their former bases, and Frank Knuckles, both have charged him with not paying them royalty. So her talking about that isn't, you know, that's a matter of public record. And that's Frank, common in the industry that yeah. people don't get checks for their contributions. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible, but that's like pretty common. Like, oh, yeah, you didn't get paid. That, that sounds about right. That's believable. That's not a stretch. Right, Hub saying that they cut off his health insurance after he found out he had cancer. She's not saying anything new there. Flo Brown not getting the accolade she deserved as a writer and artist, not getting put on. That's a matter of public record. Jill Scott getting kicked to the curb on You Got Me on behalf of Erica Badu. <laughs> That's a matter of public record. They both spoken about that. Record. There's enough truth there. I mean, and I think that and having watched, like you said, the very long videos, um, one of which is an hour by itself. She asked for, you know, atonement. She asked for, she, she, she discusses her ways of being complicit. She discusses her ways of playing the game in order to get through. She's like, you know, I just was like, I need to just get to the other side of this and so I can be on. She, you know, says over and over, I didn't have the integrity of a Flo Brown. I didn't have the integrity of some of the women who said no. You know, I allowed them to exploit my talent and I allowed them to exploit my body. Wow. Um, now, she doesn't say she was sexually assaulted by any of the Roots members. She makes that clear. But that she did engage in sexual, you know, favors with them in order to, you know, have, a, have a, her shine, have a moment. Damn. You know, and this also talks about the fact that Black Lily didn't get the support by them that because it was women's work, right? The Jazzy Fat Nasty's women put that on and and she was part of that. You know, we've already seen like OK Player was what they invested in. They didn't invest in Black Lily's sustainability. Black Lily ended after five years, right? 
that's also a matter of public record. So it's, it's hard to say where, where the lies are. <laughs> yeah. I'm more inclined to believe people when they start, like, spilling their own tea. Because when people be like, oh, it's all everybody else's fault. You'd be like, well, and they'd be like, well, here's what I did. And like, oh, okay, you're telling everything. I agree with you. Like, I mean, the fact that she was willing to say I was complicit in this, I'm not immune to having done these things. It's funny because there were things I, that she brought up. I was like, oh, I forgot you had done that. I had forgot about her Jay-Z Unplugged moment, which was crazy because at the time, it was the hottest thing that year. Everybody was talking about her on Song Cry. And then it was weird, like, she didn't get the kind of backing and support on her second album after her first album did well. There were things that are completely verifiable. And, you know, if anybody just pays attention to it, I think what's going to be interesting is that what she has called for is today women who have been harmed by the roots and the crew to come together for a discussion. Oh. Um, uh, as a WCW. That's, that's going to be ugly. <laughs> That's going to be yeah. ugly. You know, so she said, like, if you have a woman who's been harmed, if you've been sexually assaulted, if you've been sexually harassed um, by this, by members of this band, if you've been exploited, you know, let's have a conversation. And as we know, when there's one, there's usually more than one. Yeah, when there's one, there's like a hundred. This was a, a hip hop band, guys touring in their 20s and 30s on the road. Not that the 40s and 50s are much better, but on the road, like, that's, that's, that's going to be a shit show. Is this happening on her IG Live? Where is this happening? I think that she's doing, like, a separate Zoom for the WCW. She said for the people to, I guess, DM her, and they would have a conversation amongst women. And she's really trying to find Flo Brown. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure at this point, somebody from the Roots Camp has <laughs> identified and found Flo Brown and tried to intervene on that because, you know, she wants somebody else who has receipts. Yeah. And who had the integrity to say no to some of the things that were being offered. It was also like, I think for people who are fans of people like Jill and Erica, there's some bitter pills to swallow. Apparently her and Jill Scott were best friends. Um, and they no longer are. And she did do that thing that you're not supposed to do with best friends, even after you stop being best friends with them, which is spill a whole bunch of their personal business, sexual business. And there's a reason I didn't bring up the Jill Scott or Erica Badu thing. Like, you know, grown folks having consensual sex is their business. You know, it's your vagina, the yeah. police, as you see fit. So I don't really care. I did see something about, because um, I don't know, like... This is going back like 20 years for me. And I used to go to all the concerts, getting there early and standing in the front row for general admission. Same. I just remember like, like Booty from Erica Badu. Jaguar Wright was like, yeah, that was about me and over Common. And I was like, what? And then she was like, Common hasn't been right since Lauren Hill broke up with him. And I was like, Common and Lauren Hill dated? When the fuck was this? <laughs> like, yeah, I was like, I missed all of that. I never knew who Booty was about. I just assumed it was someone non-industry related. I didn't know it was about Jaguar, right? And I was like, what? What's interesting is you can tell generationally who's where. You know, I'm 45. So for me, we're talking about my sweet spot in my 20s. Mm -hmm. when I was at every concert for everything like that and, and, and completely part of the granola backpack culture and loving it. <laughs> exactly. I wore head wraps. Like, I didn't wear weaves. I took my acrylics off. Like... Bruh, I was all in. And was collecting every album and debating the, the merits of it and watching BET when BET had videos. You know, I've been hearing a lot of young people like, who's that? And I'm like, oh, wow. For the 40 and up crowd, this is like the tea of all tea. Like, this is hot piping, triple pour tea. And it's all of our conscious faith. Somebody posted on Facebook, I'm Mark Say from Jaguar Rights Allegation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that there's too many people she didn't mention. And she said she's going to keep doing it until they put some respect on Malik B's name. Now, personally, at this point, I would have had every kind of tribute, flowers. The first video, midway through, I would have had a whole, like, 500-word Instagram you caption. Stop. Whatever you need, sis. You need me to, like, erect a statue in Philly, whatever you need. Exactly. So you stop. Pay for the funeral, something. Like, do something. Stop this woman. Because she don't give no fuck. She's out. She's fresh out. Fresh out. I mean, and she's free. 
right? Like, she doesn't owe anybody anything right now. She's managed to still tour. Everything that's mentioned about her, they always say she's toured every year <laughs> since, like, 2000. And she has, to hear her tell it, 150 songs in a vault. And she's going to be releasing music throughout 2020, 2021. She's writing and producing for other people, so she doesn't have to play the industry game. She never was good at it anyway. I remember the liner notes from the first album in which she just called everybody out. Right. I heard liner notes from her first album. She's doing that. Somebody who's free and who doesn't have to play in the game, who doesn't have to kiss any butt. And you know, to hear her tell if you made bad choices, you should have made better choices. You should have made better choices. Um, I think a lot about that, like, because I came up in journalism and I was working for Vibe and Source and Double XL in One World. And I was interviewing like all the rappers and I got stories on stories on stories about inappropriate behavior, inappropriate comments, crazy shit. And I've just like never shared it. And I'm not the only one. I talk sometimes to like other people behind the scenes and we all got the same stories. But it's like no one ever thought that those like young women in the industry in their 20s would ever grow up to be women with platforms. I guess social media didn't exist, so the idea of having a personal platform was foreign. But they just never thought that these women would grow up and start talking about all the stuff that they knew and they would have, like, legitimate voices. Yeah, I think that, you know, before there were gatekeepers. I mean, and I, I, like you, I've worked as a music critic for 18 years and, and my own music journalism. And so the stories, you know, over that time, have been pretty consistent. I mean, and you don't have to even be in the game like you or I were in the game. Like, you can just watch any unsung or behind the music. Like, the story is consistent. You know, there was drugs. There was sexual inappropriateness. There were fights. You know, people didn't get paid. All of that is so recurring as a theme. I'm a co-producer and head writer for Indie Soul Journeys, which is talking about the indie music scene. I'm coming on PBS this year. And we were trying really hard not to do stories that were just about drugs or just about, you know, like, because it's so cliche now. But it's so hard because that's the story. That's the story. To your point, I think a lot of people who are not in the street, you know, still are managed to be shocked, you know, about their faith not being just one thing, not just being whatever the public persona is. But um, I hope that after this era that we'll have gotten past that. So I guess the other part of this is like gender, right? And how women who have to navigate patriarchal systems in society, you know, don't get to be nice and sweet all the time if they want their voices heard. Jaguar right as soon as said it, like, I tried to play the game and it drove me crazy. Literally drove her crazy. Mm-hmm. I tried to keep your lies and the stories and... It harmed me. You know, we see for women who decide not to play that game, they too are armed. You know, they too are marginalized. They too get labeled difficult or bitches or whatever, like, the thing that we're, you know, patriarchal society decides. Yeah. They want to do to marginalize the voices of those women who have agency. You know what's so funny? And I talked about this earlier in the podcast because I have a segment, a segment on Kamala Harris being called Too Ambitious. And <laughs> like, what does that even mean? I was like, what does that even you mean? Really like, be God too ambitious. yeah, in, in this vein, I'm like, if you're a woman and you play along, then you end up getting, you know, sexually assaulted on a tour bus or attempted yeah. sexual assault on a tour bus. But if you are not with the shit and you speak out, then you're a bitch. You're harmed one way or another. You know, there's like a no win there. Well, even worse than that, you play the game. And you still don't get what you were promised. Like, you give up the sex, and you still don't get the signing bonus or the or the, the role or the whatever, like, which has happened to a lot of people, right? A lot of women. I do hope Jaguar Wright, in speaking her piece, has found happiness. I think she probably slept really well these last few nights. <laughs> the sis laid some, poured some tea and laid some burdens down. I was like, sis, I hope you got your full eight hours with REM the whole way. Yeah, I mean, I think she did. And, like, that's a tough bra. You know, I wouldn't want to fight Jaguar, right? No. (laughs) No. Am I all caught up on on celebrity news? Because I've been traveling the last week and, like, I feel like I got some things and I missed some things. I love the fact that for at least two to three days straight, 
all black people could talk about was the art of two black women, Beyonce and Brandy. Wait, does Brandy have a new album? <laughs> so I saw all these, these conversations about Brandy, and I thought it was because Moesha is on Netflix. Ah! Well, you know, that was uh, a happy uh, coincidence for her, some serendipity there. But no, she had an album drop um, last week, B7. People either love it or they hate it. I have not heard any middle ground. It's a vibe, a vibey project, right? Like it's a atmospheric, ambiance, ambient, you know, type of a project. And that's not what some of the fans who like the brandy of Full Moon and Never Say Never want from her. Now, some of the folks who might have liked Aphrodisiac and, you know, that sound or 211, they, you know, can get with some of it. I think there's only really one traditionally structured song in there, and that's the duet with Daniel Caesar that was already on his album, my second album. I don't love the whole thing, but the fact that I was able to find five songs I could get with was enough for me to be like, okay, cool. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of people who are hating this album. Uh, but she won because the conversation was so big that she did 50 million streams her opening Ooh, weekend. Good for her. I've always liked Brandy and I've always liked her music. So <laughs> good for her. Oh, can we talk about, what's her name? Zoe Saldana. Yes. Crying on the damn internet about I shouldn't have done that Nina Simone role. Like we told you not to do that shit. Well, but we told her not to do it after we already saw it. <laughs> no, 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 no. When we heard she was playing Nina Simone, everyone was like, sis, you're not right for this role. You don't look nothing like Nina Simone. We told her, and she was like, no, no, like, I'm a black woman, and I can represent black women, and I'm an actress, and sis, no, you don't, mm-mm, mm-mm. Let's be real, like, part of it was that Zoe Saldana is the aesthetic that is traditionally considered classically beautiful. And Nina Simone was not considered that at the time, you know, though we loved her and we thought her beautiful. Um, We thought all her African features were gorgeous, but that was not the prevailing thought. So, you know, you're light skinned, you're, (laughs) you have straight hair, but I think it was worse and compounded by seeing her with the prosthetic nose and the dark, the, 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 you know, blue, black, dark makeup that looked like blackface. Exactly. That did it. Like, that was murderous. Exactly. Know? Just go find a brown skin girl who don't have to sit in four hours of makeup every day. Like, it's real easy. They exist. So easy. I mean, and while Zoe was on the come up at the time, it wasn't like her name was going to bring people to the, you know, to the box office by itself. And Daniel Oweloe. So I, it wasn't like they chose her because her draw was just so fierce. You know, Colombiana didn't make the kind of money that, you know, which came out like before that, you know, didn't make the kind of money that said, should have said to the producers, oh, her name value is going to be significant enough. If I recall, like the movie was produced by white folks. So you know how sometimes like they'd be like, oh, well, a black person was in this billion dollar movie. And so black people must love them and they'd be great for this role. And black people be like, nah, that's no. No, we we glad to see this, but we ain't checking for her exclusively. And not as Dina Simone. You want to put her in a rom-com? I'd be like, all right, let's go see her. Let's go see what she's talking about. Exactly. I, I know, you know, some people have been clowning her for the video, but I, I'm I'm glad for the apology. I'm glad for the acknowledgement that, yo, that was a mistake. Because it, it was a colossal mistake that harmed her name with black folks. And she tried to sing in the movie, and I was like, no, 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 no. And it was, like, historically inaccurate. It wasn't a good movie. Like, there were, like, no upsides to the film. You weren't like, oh, if this could have been an amazing movie if somebody else had played the role. No. no. Like, nothing about it was redeeming. It was no. just a bad movie. And we told Sis, do not do this. And she insisted. But I'm glad she's had a it come to Jesus. She's recognized the error of her ways. Well, I guess last thing I'm going to just tell folks who might be readers among your listeners is that Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning Mm. uh, book, The Warmth of Other Suns, today's new book came out, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. It's an Oprah Book Club book. Isabel Wilkerson is one of the most prolific and most amazing writers 
that we have out here, historians and a journalist. Um, she had already won Pulitzer's for her work in the New York Times before she even got to the Once of Other Sons, which is being made into a, I think, an Amazon limited series right now. So, yeah, definitely folks who checked out that book that debuted today. Boom. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And anytime you want to invite me back, I'm more than willing to come and sit with you, Demetria. Thank you so much. You're a friend in my head. Like, I started following you on Facebook, like, maybe, like, four or five months ago. And I was like, how was I not tapped in? And you were like, I knew you. And I was like, how did I not know you? It's like we're the same person. <laughs> this, was, this was a lot of fun. So I appreciate you and all that you do for our community. Thank you. Isn't he great? Like, I love when the friends in my head are as dope in person as they are on the page. It don't translate for everybody. Some people be dope on the page, then you, like, meet them and they have zero personality. And you be like, I don't understand. There's a disconnect. Clearly, that doesn't apply here. So thanks again, L. Michael Gibson. And if you would like more L. Michael Gibson in your life, you can follow him on Instagram at the Gibson Gazette. That's T-H-E-G-I-P as in Paul S-O-N Gazette. You can also follow him on Facebook at L. Michael Gibson. So that is our podcast for this week. I will be back next week on time. If you need some ratchet and respectable antics in your life in the meantime, please follow me on social media at Demetria L. Lucas on Facebook, Instagram, not so much Twitter. Twitter, they do the most over there. I can't be over on Twitter too often. But the other two, I post a lot. So if you need some antics before next week, follow me there. If you liked what you heard today, and I hope you did, please subscribe to Ratchet and Respectable on whatever platform you are listening to the podcast. I would greatly appreciate it. Sometimes it takes me a while to post on social media that a new episode is up. But if you are subscribed, you won't have to wait on me. You'll get a notification as soon as it's live. That is everything. And we will talk again next week. Bye.